Hello and good morning, good afternoon or good evening, depending from which place you are listening and watching. We have about 1,000 people joining this webinar, which is a small-sized theatre and something we would never have achieved without the COVID pandemic, because that's the time when we found all of this out, that this was possible. This is our second webinar, and actually it is the first in the series of four that we will broadcast this year. This seminar is all about color. And it, and, it, and, and it is about the effects color has on the well-being of people in their indoor environment. Now, my name is Willem Bermanje. I am Director of Communications at Frober Flooring Systems, and I will be your host for today. I have invited two experts, one from Germany, Carola Sebold, who is working with Pantone, and who I will introduce somewhat later, Karen Haller from Australia, who runs her own color business. Um, but first, something else. When I think about color, strangely enough, for me, Michael Portillo always comes to mind. Do you remember him? He used to be a British politician, and he was a cabinet minister, a cabinet minister. but actually he got famous by presenting the great British railway uh, um, journeys which later mounted into great railway journeys of the world. Michael always made a color statement. Whether it was in red or blue or pink or yellow, he had the most wonderful combinations. And it made the program somewhat frivolous and gay, which was really good. And how do I imagine that color in the interior environment or color of our products, floor coverings, would be like when they would be like Michael Portillo's jackets and trousers and shirts. Unfortunately, when it comes to floor covering, what we are looking at is beige and gray. And in terms of marketing, we now call it sand and concrete and pebble, but in essence, it is still beige and gray. That's what we want to talk about today with our two experts. First, Carola Sebold, who is Global Account Director uh, global Key Account Management at uh, Pantone in uh, the UK. She is talking to us from Germany and her presentation is about what Pantone is doing. You know Pantone? You must know Pantone. You all must have had the Pantone color scheme when you were thinking about the color of your walls, the color of your furniture, your interior. That's what Pantone is, is, is actually really good at. Now, Carola is a marketing executive, so she's not a designer. She's not a architect, but she knows a lot about her company and the systems that they are using. That is what Carola will be talking about in the next presentation, which will take about 15 to 20 minutes. Carola, up to you. So yeah, today we want to talk about really well-being and how does it means to, to, to feel good. And feel good has a lot of to do with understanding trends, especially if you're a professional person, has something to do with do you feel really educated and in your professional atmosphere? And this is what I want to talk to you about today. So let's start with the importance and the influence of color in a, in a general thing, because we are surrounded by color every day, all the time in our private life, in our professional life, but we forget very often how important a color is for us feeling good or not feeling good, for example. That means what is the influence of color? In 80% of all our human experience, this is filtered through our eyes. It's not coming by hearing or by smelling. We see something and we judge very often something by the color, which is coming through our eyes. So let's have a first check with you. And normally these features I have done in, in a live atmosphere, which is of course much more entertaining also for me because I can see your reaction. So now I can just imagine your reaction. If I would ask you, what what company stands behind this behind this building because you want to learn how important is that color defines our world you would for sure say this is ikea because we are learned blue and yellow big buildings is ikea do you know what this is a is a huh, um sorry a museum in germany for airplanes and i was driving a car and therefore the photo is not very good and I was on the motorway and said, hey, stop, since when has Ikea opened a store here? And then I was make quickly a photo with my iPhone and I find out, hey, it's an airplane museum. And do you know what? Of course, Ikea has protected their color combination 
for furniture. But of course, you can also only protect colors in a specific context. So of course, they cannot do it for airplane museum. And for sure, this airplane museum has done it by purpose to use the same type of buildings and the same color combination, because that let people stop. And then you got more visitors to your airplane museum. Very smart idea, just based on color. Colors influencing our product purchasing decisions from 50 to 85%. So this is something which you should keep in mind. It doesn't matter if you work in food, in flooring, in smartphones, in whatever you're working for your color development. It's very important that the color is right because this is the, all, the most single attribute which is influencing about a purchasing decision or a decision not to buy something. 95% of all our decisions related to color are made by our emotional side. It's not that we think about the pink strawberry is not good for us. We, we know it by our intuition that only the red one is good for us. And color has changed a lot over the years. So this is the so-called white sport, at least at the big, at, in the 80s, this was called the white sport tennis. This is Steffi Graf from Germany. And at that time, it was more or less, not really mandatory, but more or less people wearing white dresses. Today, you know, if you watch sometimes tennis, you see that color is really used to really differentiate from others and also give us some symbolic character. So that means Serena Williams, which is for sure maybe not the thinnest lady on earth, but she wants to express, hey, I'm a lady, I'm female. So she used her well-being by being using a color, which is this uh, very, very light lilac color. So let's have a look to micro trends 21, 22. Stay home. This is, and to be honest, if somebody would told you March 2020 that we stay home still March 2021, nobody would believe it. So stay home at the beginning was really well being. Now it starts to get a lot of aspects which we like, maybe the family life, but a lot of things which we are also missing by staying home, maybe the social life. And also home office, which seems to be at the beginning a nice idea and uh, very comfortable becomes more and more challenging. So I think everybody is happy if they can go back to their offices. But at the same time, we understand that the only thing we can still do in these times and becomes much more important for our well-being is going out to the nature, really see what we can do there without doing a lot of traveling, but just going to the nature uh, next to where we are living. And is the nature becoming only important because we understand it's more or less the only alternative of sitting home? Or do we realize more and more that we destroy our nature? I think it's a mix of both. And of course, we understand more and more that we can get energy from nature, which help us to feel better in our mind and our body. Everything which is related to nature, we try to bring hope. And William said before, we, we have a look to well-being also at home. And this is something about gardening. Gardening can be on the smallest balcony. Gardening can be also mean interior gardening, like having swimming pools indoor looks like outdoor pool. Or even that one, which is a nice example, is an interior garden. So bringing nature home to you, that means also the flooring is again a beige color. And I listened to William, he said beige is something which you want to refresh and not have only beige, but this is specific beige, a wooden beige. So in this in combination with green is something that looks like a little bit the garden at home. Of course, all the green shades helps to get the feeling of being outdoor. And another big macro trend is spiritual. So all these yoga things, all these kind of spiritual activities which help us to balance our mind is something which gets more and more important in this time of not only corona, corona but in a trend. So it means we try to broaden our mind to look a little bit behind the boxes to really understand ourselves better. And of course, everything which I show you about macro trends can end up and translate it into a color world. And this is the nice color world, world which you can see here. And if you would go into a living room of somebody with this color combination, you, you learn so much about the personality of the person who is living there. So this is really a kind of spiritual color combination this person uh, prefer here. 
And if you take spiritual to the end, we call it Nixon. And Nixon is something which is a Netherlands word, which means just doing nothing, nothing, really nothing. Not really having music on the ears by lying on the ocean, not talking to somebody, just do nothing. And this is really the total relaxing time which we need to do from time to time. Of course, this also relates back to a color world, which can be the green and the blue from the ocean. And another thing which is really an important macro trend is something about looking more to production, which is local, not really just think about the best price what you can get in the world, but really try to look to local production. Also something which is important for our world is to get a lot of new things all the time. Don't stand still. So this you can see in a lot of collections where they drop collections, which are much smaller than before. They do it just for a short period of time and they do it more and more often. Another trend which is important for all of us is sharing things, not really owning things anymore, really sharing things. Can be cars, can be scooters, uh, yeah, not, not animal and pets yet, but maybe this soon, but all the things of sharing something becomes much more popular in our world. Sustainability, a trend which is not new, not at all, but it's still going on. We try to get colors and shades from nature. We feel better if you're surrounded by natural products instead of a lot of plastic, like you can see here in the photo with the old bottles or the carton thing. And of course, a good thing is one person's trash is another person's treasure. So to really recycle things in a smart way. Oh, this is a nice example from a company Ott in Paris. They have done um, a special material called Banana Text. It's a sustainable beeswax coated canvas. And they really have done uh, sneakers in this material totally free from any plastic material. Of um, course, one brand of H&M, which also help us to protect the nature better. They, you can do a subscription there, like you can do uh, clothes by rental. That means you pay a subscription fee and then you can go into the store and you can rent some, um, um, how do you say, some clothing and bring it back after a while. So very nice idea for a kind of recycling, reuse things. Let's see how far it goes. It's a test, which I do in the moment in China. And of course, a big macro trend, which is also not new, but it got a very, very strong push is digitization. Or well, not only in our professional world, of course, also in our private world. And let's have a look, how does it look? So of course, we all know these video conferences, which we do now day by day. And of course, also in the private life, you can have virtual happy hours, you can have virtual other meetings, song, sing songs together. I saw it once from an elderly home, even where elderly people try to get introduced to this new world of digital. And of course, even virtual concepts can be taking place. And of course, we have workshops where we even can learn something uh, about how to assemble new flower bouquets. So we learn to really live with this virtual and digital world. And of course, everything which I talk about in digital, and this is my last chapter for the last minutes of the presentation, what we figure out, and I'm already 12 years with Panton, and as William said, I'm the global key account team leader. So I deal with all the big key accounts. And uh, the obvious thing is if people don't feel educated in their job and they feel overwhelmed by maybe this digital thing which is coming, they don't feel good anymore. So well-being feeling is really coming also from feeling, I work professional, I know what I do, I can cope with all the new things coming around. And let's have a quick look, what does it mean? So the digital solution can be done in every step of a color workflow. This is the important message. It's not only something which is for suppliers or only for designers. If you work really digital, you should start in design and you can work step by step through all the different steps color is flowing until the production side. And the question is, why should we work digital? Why should we have digital support? I'll give you an example. Let's test your eyes. And this is again, you just have to answer by yourself. If I ask you, what is the difference between the left side t-shirt and the right side t-shirt? 
you would clearly say, if you're honest to yourself, the left side is much more reddish, the right side on top is much more greenish. But do you know what? This is just because your eyes are failing. If you remove the background, it's exactly the same t-shirt. It's this kind of optical illusion which help us to understand that we are not machines, we are human beings. We need a support in digital to help us to make color correct. Try to remember this color. This is really simple, it's just a pink. Do you know which color it was? You cannot, because this is exactly what I mean. We are not machines. So I make this, in, this question very often in a live audience, and then you get 10 different answers from the same group of people sitting in the same room with the same cultural difference, uh, background. So it was tea, but the tea, if you said tea before, I would say it was probably by accident. So the problem is we are not machines. We need digital support. And I want to just show you two small examples. And we have, of course, a lot more digital things also for the supply chain. But I understand today we are, today are more professionals from the design side uh, um, attending this webinar. So one thing, really have a look to our website. And this should not be a selling session today. But this is such a nice, amazing tool, this card. It's called Color Match Card. And this card enables your smartphone to measure colors not for quality control, but give you a much better feeling which color the pineapple, for example, is, which is the next matching in the Pantone theme. This card is the size of a credit card. It costs maybe the price of a, a cinema ticket. So it's really very affordable and it's a tool which is very amazing. This card helped by the colorful bubble to calibrate your smartphone to be really use your normal smartphone as a color picker tool. And what you get, what it comes with this card is an app. And this app enable not only your smartphone to use all the Pantom libraries, you can also use the Pantom Connect app on your computer. And this is a totally free of charge service. So you can upload all the Pantom colors. It doesn't matter which library you're using to all the Pantom uh, Adobe design software. So this is free of charge, use it. You have all the libraries from Pantone sitting inside Adobe then, and you have really a seamless working in the digital side of a designer. So this is from my side. Thank you very much for listening. Um, I'm sure that Karen gave you a lot of insights of well-being from the color psychology side, and we are here at the end for Q&A, of course. Thank you very much, Carola. Very interesting presentation, and Karen told me I should never say it's a very interesting presentation because that is uh, that is a little bit of a of a killer. But you s certainly showed how Pantone is working, and I was wondering, now that you are using digital tools, are you not becoming a color forecaster? Because I'm sure that you have a lot of data that you can work with, so that when people are using the app and when people are designing their clothes, that you see the colors that they are using and that you are in with the trend, so to say? Um, yeah, of course, the thing is, William, with trend forecasting is that our team is working two, three years ahead of time to forecast colors. So what we see then, in, in, in you're right, we see, of course, which, which colors are used by people, and we do analyzes from time to time to understand what are the, the hot sellers in colors. But do you know if we do that? Make a guess what is the hot selling colors in textile? It's white, it's navy blue, and it's red. Because okay. this is where in every collection you have a white, a navy blue, and a red. So these are our best-selling colors year over year. Okay. So and, and all the rest is really uh, following a lot of trend forecasting. But it's an interesting job, I agree with you. And we can do even more, maybe analyze. And one last question for now. Whenever there's a trend coming up, like the trend um, of nature that you explained in the beginning, and there's a green that, uh, that becomes very popular. Could it be the case that you discover that that is a green that you do not have, that you have to make an adaptation? Or is everything colored in your, or covered in your Pantone system? You're totally right. We have uh, approximately five, six, seven, eight thousand colors in a total, but you can see millions of colors. What is our intention? I think that's a very important message. Of course, we have missing colors, but what we take care for is the colors we have in our products are colors you can reproduce for either fabrics, 
or paint or print. You ch not ch just add colors because the trend is there. You make sure that these colors can be used from the people to go to their suppliers and get exactly the color I produce. So there will be all the time gaps forever. But what we do, we add all, um, every few years, we add a lot of new colors following new trends. You totally agree. And we have custom color service. So every color you okay. find, and you could not find our booklets, approach me and we can have custom color Good. services in all materials almost. Maybe in the end, a few people will. I hope um, so. Okay. We Thank are now moving much. a little bit closer <laughs> to the uh, subject of um, the effects of color in interior spaces. And we're going to do that with Karin Haller. And it really is Karin Haller and not Karen Heller. Karin is from Australia, but her ancestors are Dutch. Karin is actually joining us from Australia, where it's in the middle of the night. So thank you very much for staying up late, Karin. And um, right. uh, looking forward to your presentation. Just a little bit about yourself. You are a leading global expert in the field of behavior, color and design psychology, specializing in business brand color, interiors, healthcare and well-being, the topic that we are touching upon today. You are advising companies, you are helping on brand colors, you are looking at the human experience in balance with nature. You work global with architects and designers and help them understand color better in their day-to-day -day work. Uh, you have sent us and shared with us a presentation on your work and on what you can see as being the effects on well-being of color in the interior design. Could I ask you to make your presentation and afterwards we will have the Q&A sessions for all of us. So yes, as uh, Willem has said, it is the, uh, the middle of the night here. I'm normally based in, uh, in London in the UK but I've uh, managed to get back to Australia. So I'm just, I'm here for a few months. So uh, let's get started. So as um, Carolyn mentioned, up to 85% of shoppers place color as the primary reason why they make um, a purchase of any type. And even if that's um, a product, whether that's, um, you know, people going into cafes, going to restaurants, buying anything for the home color is the uh, is is the main driver and what is interesting is that we're only about 20 percent conscious of the color decisions that we make so we're doing this on, on a on a subconscious on a subconscious level and you've probably already made you know thousands you know hundreds of color decisions already today so the reason why we do purchase on colour and the reasons why we, we, we base our decisions on colour is because colour makes us feel something. And what's happening is, is that when we take colour in, we're having an emotional reaction, we're having an emotional response, not just to the one colour, but to all the colours that are around us. So if we're in a restaurant, in a cafe, if we're in a home, if we're in the workplace, doesn't matter where we are or in a shop, we are having this emotional reaction to all the colors because we take in all the colors that are around us. And we like to think that we're actually logical um, human beings, but what we actually do is we, we buy on emotion because we, we connect to the emotion first. And then what we do is we justify afterwards then with logic, but we do make our um, purchasing decisions and they're based on an emotional need or an emotional um, desire or emotional want. And what's also really interesting is, is that we connect to colour first. So we connect to colour and we could, when we take in colour before we take in shapes, before we take in words, materials, before anything else, we're having this emotional connection with colour first. So colour creates that all important emotional connection, that all important emotional driver. So where does this instinctive response come from? This instinct that we feel when we're in space, this connection that we feel, nature actually holds the key. Nature is the solution to, to all of this. We have this uh, symbiotic relationship with nature. It is where we've come from. It's where our ancestors come from. And it's, we, we have this, um, this, yeah, or say symbiotic, this undeniable connection that we have, that we have with nature. And nature, um, as to say, yeah, nature 
goes beyond uh, trends. It go, goes beyond fashion. It goes beyond um, fads. This is this is not a this is this is not a trend thing. I really believe that this is really important for us to connect to, and. This is the message that I was saying last year in a lot of talks, and I really believe that it's still relevant now, is that people will want more than ever this sense of connection, this sense of belonging, to be surrounded by things that feel familiar. And this, fami this thing that feels familiar is, is nature. And so reconnecting and aligning ourselves back to nature is the future of design, and it really is where I see design heading. And behavioural colour and design psychology is a methodology that is based on nature. It connects out the human-centred design with nature. And when these two things to come together, this is where I think we actually have this, this um, yeah, it, it, that, that's when the beauty comes. And because, because if we are originally from nature and we lived through the seasons and we lived by the seasons, then having a human centered design and having this nature connected this is really when i feel that we're coming we're coming back home to 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 design and it's what makes design also sustainable and it's long cycle design it's not um yeah trends fads it's not something that we just dispose of and throw away it's about future proofing design so what does this look like in in its simplest terms Colour, it's, well, it's, it's about influencing positive behaviours because colour is more than a mood, it's more than a feeling. Colour influences behaviour. And we can't see a mood and we can't see a feeling. So you, can, you can't tell how anyone feels or their mood, but you can tell how someone reacts, how someone responds in a, in a space because of their behaviour. And that to me is the really, if there's one thing that you take away from my talk is to start basing um, design on behavior and not on, you know, oh, this looks like a nice mood or a nice feeling. Really, we need to, we need to have a step change and move and move on from that. So what we're really looking to do is to create positive environments that influence positive behaviors for positive change and positive outcomes. I know I'm using a lot of positives there. The reason why I'm saying positive about four times is because color can be used, color can influence behavior, absolutely. But you can also influence behavior in a negative, in a negative way. And you can influence, use color to influence in a positive way. So that's why I really want to instill that what we're looking for always when we're using color is, is positive outcomes. And especially when return on investment is important for business and all the factors of well-being are you know, being measured, you know, air quality, um, light, sound, everything is being measured. Colour can be measured as well. And that's, this is really what the intention is behind behavioural design, um, behavioural colour design psychology is because colour and design influences how we think, how we feel, and how we behave. So to give you something uh, to take away, and you might want to write this down, is I have a five step um, framework that I use when I work with my clients. And what I want to share with you is step number two. And this is about assessing behavioral triggers, triggers and motivators because this is what is measurable. A lot of people think that color is, um, something aesthetically pretty, they think colour is something that is, um, you know, a trend of fad, it's, it's, it's not important, it's just visual and that is it. But if we take in colour before anything else, if we do have this emotional connection and this, the emotion that triggers us in our behaviours, then what we want to do is when we're using colour, we want to make sure that we know that we've got the right environment and we've created the right environment for whoever that is, whether that is for the home, for an office, whether it's for hospitals, for the, you know, um, department stores, whatever, whatever it is, if you can find out what the behaviours are that they're wanting and the one behaviours that they don't want, 
you can then put that into your um, scheme. And then at the end, when you finish the whole work, then you can measure that by the behaviors of how the people are showing up in that space. And that's how you can make it measurable. I mean, this is only one step in, in, in my process, but what you're looking for is you're looking for triggers, triggers of behaviors that, that you don't want. So ask your client, what are their biggest pain points? You know, what is it they're experiencing now that they don't want to have in the future? Because quite often they will say you know, that they'll explain to you that people are behaving a certain way or they're reacting or responding in a certain way and they don't want that. They don't want those behaviors. They want people to behave in a very different way. Um, so for instance, like in a restaurant, it could be a restaurant where they want it a very fine dining. They want everyone to be very calm and very quiet. But what they don't want is a lot of running around. And so colors can be used to help influence and trigger people for people to or people to know that, oh, actually, this is a place, this isn't, this isn't McDonald's, you know, this isn't a place to go running around. This is a place actually that we need to be quiet in. And because of and it and it does influence then the way that people will behave in the space. Then motivators are behaviors that you do want. So ask them what is working for them now. And also, because there will be there will be um, behaviors that are positive and work and that are working now, but also what positive change, what outcomes do they want to see in the future? So by asking that is that this helps you to then guide you towards what colors, what color palette to use. It will help you to guide you towards the proportion of colors to use because you could use a small proportion of, of a particular color will give you one type of feel, one type of behavior. But if you increase that particular color, it could, you, you could very well get the adverse side of those behaviors, which is what you don't want. So, so um, the, the, the color palette, the saturation of colors, whether they're soothing, whether they're stimulating, the proportion of colors, the placement of colors, all of these will have an impact. And of course, the design as well. And because what we're wanting to do is we're wanting to create um, a space that ultimately uh, people will thrive in because it's predicted that by uh, 2050, that up to 75 or 70% 70 of us will be living in urban, um, urban environments. And it used to be, I think in the, like the 1950s, it was 80% of people lived rural. So lived very much connected to nature. And now that's going to completely flip. So what we, we do and what I really believe that we have a responsibility to do is to, um, it's not to make every house and every indoor, every, you know, everything green. It's not like that at all because every color we, is in nature except brilliant white, but every color is in nature. So it's about creating the familiar, creating that what we're, what we're um, comfortable being and that we feel very safe, we feel very connected in and environments that will actually, and that is what I believe is, the, is, the, is really the future of, well, of well-being. So um, that's the end of my talk then, Willem. That leaves room for a lot of questions. Um, yes, I'm, sure I'm, I'm actually wondering if you if you make that statement, ultimately, we want to create spaces where people will not just live or be uh, productive, but feel safe, connected and thrive. Do you then mean to say that every choice uh, that a company is making, that a house owner is making, that a brand is making is an individual choice? Um, what do you mean by individual? Indiv that 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 one car could be very different in terms of the colors that they are using than the other car. Uh, that one um, fast food chain could be very different in its expression in color and design than mm -hmm. another one because they just want to reach the, out to different people. Is that expressed yep. through color? Yes. So the restaurant is a good example is every brand will have its own brand personality. Mm -hmm. And if we look at the restaurants, and so they will have a certain look and a certain feel. 
and the way they're designed. So if we use a fast food restaurant and a fine dining restaurant, mm -hmm. they are also attracting a different type of target market. So whilst they need to show up authentically and say, this is who, who the brand is, this is, who we st this, is, this is how we're showing up and this is who we are as an authentic brand, it is also who is our ideal target market and how do we attract them in to make sure that the right target market comes to us and not the wrong one? So the colours and the design style, the logo, the way that the, 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 um, the restaurant or the fast food outlet has been designed will attract that kind of target market. Because when you look at fast, even just the fast food market itself, there are so many different types of fast food companies and they are all putting their stake in the sand and saying, this is us, this is who we are, this is what we stand for. And if you, if you like us and if, we, if, if, if you feel connected to us, then you, then you will come to us. Okay. Because we will walk past three or four super, uh, you know, restaurants, cafes, until we walk into one and we go, ah, this one gets me, this one, I relate to this, this one understands me, so I will go into this one. And that is through, yes, there is the, the menu, there's all of that, but it's the colour and the design style that what attracts us first in. Yet for all of, for all of them, uh, the saying goes, nature holds the key. So they're all fishing out of the same pond, more or less. Yes, yes, because okay. that, is, but that, but that, that is where we come from, isn't it? Mm -hmm. We come from nature okay. and we, we really need to reconnect. Because I really believe every step we take away from nature, we take away from ourselves. There is this, there is this disconnect that is happening and it is, yes, digital, um, AI, all of that is great, but there is a point to where we feel this disconnect. And I, this is where we feel a disease and a discomfort. And we, we, we can feel that there is this disconnect. And this, this is because we're disconnecting ourselves so far from nature, which means it is so far removed from ourselves. Would it also be the reason when I talked about floors being beige or gray or being wood colors or stone colors or concrete colors, that this also has to do with this link to nature. We actually noticed that in the type of floors and the type of colors that we are selling, that they are natural, so to say. I mean, every color is natural. Okay. Mm -hmm. But it's what, what, what isn't, except brilliant white, I mean, that's a man-made color, but what isn't natural is this uh, trend to live in all gray. You know, we, we don't we don't say, oh, I love grey days. I love uh -huh. it, I love it when it's you know cloudy and and grey. That is not that that's not a natural state. So it's not a natural state for us to live in all white environments or grey environments because emotionally we're not connecting to that. It's that 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 is not a healthy state. So if we're talking about well being, well being is a range of it's a range of colours that. That, that work for that environment that we're in, but to, to live in all grey or to work in all grey, I mean, this mm -hmm. is why we had massive, you know, sick building syndrome in the 70s and the 80s because everything was in grey and people would have to go away for days, you know, on these away days to, and they would reconnect back in nature. They would take them in nature. People would feel very alive and energised again and then put them back in the same grey environment and wonder why a week later or two weeks later, they were back at the same point they were before. So that it's just it's just being more aware of the and I, I mean I didn't talk about color psychology as in what different colors mean because you know that information mm -hmm. people can get that on my website they can get that you know there's there's many places I wanted to to to, to make this more of a better talk about the the importance of well being. If it is well being, then well being is about this connection back. I was actually talking about grey and beige, and this is also a question from the audience. Rutger is asking, how much an effect on our well-being has the choice of a name of a colour or the marketing for it? I told you about our floors being beige and grey. Now, nowadays, we talk about pebble, and we talk about concrete, and we talk about dovetail grey or mm. donkey feet or whatever. It's all grey, <laughs> but it sounds a lot better. Yes, yeah, that's the psychology helping? of names. Oh, absolutely. That is the psychology of a name because what we then normally do is we attach, we have a memory for that name. Mm -hmm. So, you know, 
in, in, I don't know if anywhere else in the world, but in the UK, there was a phenomenon that all, um, you know, virtually every property developer would use this color called magnolia. And you say magnolia in the UK and people absolutely shudder. Their backs just, you know, their shoulders, everything goes up, they shudder. Uh -huh. But if you said buttercup or you said, um, you know, another, another name like that, you know, or, or, you know, spring yellow or something, people would, people would go, oh, wow, isn't that a lovely, what a lovely name because it conjures up a lovely image. Yeah, but it yeah. is still an emotional connection. Maybe but that's yeah, a good we point. emotionally connect to the name. Maybe that's a good point to also ask uh, Carola uh, the same question because Carola, in your Pantone color system, you're not using names, you're using numbers. No, 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 no. Ah. Uh, yeah, yeah, let's say yes or no. We have two <laughs> systems. We have one system for the graphic and print industry. And here you're totally yes. right. We just use boring numbers. But in our fashion home interior world, which normally should be used by everybody who's using anything in fashion home or interior, we have names. Every number has a nice name. And <laughs> I can underline what Karen said, that really this makes a big impact because these specific type of design people, they love to have names. So this is really, yeah, we have a lot of names and we even ah, have had names okay. where we had to change something because we have, for example, Ferrari red ones and then Ferrari said, no, you cannot use our name in your name. So ah. sometimes we have to change something, but uh, yeah, we have names. Okay, you also have that because I remember when I go to the DIY shop, I have these color cards that only have numbers. But I also saw on your website that there is this book of Pantone, especially for the interior environment, and there everything has names. Yes, correct. Yeah. So we all got to be very clever, us included, yeah. because we also <laughs> use names and numbers. Okay, yeah. um, another question. Are actually colors and the experience of colors in the environment, are they the same all over the world? Is, is color a global thing for you, Karen? Is it global? So it is, and we do, when it comes to color psychology, we, we do have um, similar um, reactions, responses to color, but color psychology is very much on the subconscious. What we have above that is color and culture. And quite often, because it's a, because it's a conscious association to color, it quite often means that if people have a very strong association in a particular culture, so for instance, in China, um, red is the color of good luck, good, good fortune, good prosperity. Red will have a very auspicious meaning in the Chinese culture. Um, and in, in um, Ireland, for instance, green for good luck. But it could be in another culture that a color has a very different meaning. So, so in the Western world, Rides typically get married in white because that is the colour um, of, in, that was made famous by Queen Victoria and it became a cultural um, belief. But whereas in China, white is the colour of death and mourning. So mm -hmm. white wine doesn't sell very well in China because of the name. Okay. But champagne sells very well, <laughs> even though you would think color. it's the same colour. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so yes. so mm -hmm. this is the importance is that is that around the world and then we also have color personal color association which is another thing but around the world colors can take on different meanings okay. if, if a culture for cultural belief and how is that for you carola do you offer the pantone color system in different varieties in asia or in europe or north america no we have tested it once in the 90s where we thought we should have a specific edition for europe and this was totally failing and we stopped it after a very short while. So I see the same thing what good Karen said there. We have one color range for the entire world. Also the color of the year, which you can see here on the back, which we launch every year is a global activity, which is really uh, taken on board everywhere in the world. Of course you have the differences and especially the, the colors Karen described before with white or red, or we have some brown, countries where brown is not very popular or in Germany, for example, bright orange is the color of the people who collect the bin on the street. So there are some colors where you have to be a little bit careful, which mm -hmm. we do, especially if you do color of the year announcement, because this is a global activity. Yeah. But uh, never, uh, beside of that, we have color guides for the entire world the same. Yes. Okay. I have another question, which is um, whether the effect of color on our well-being 
actually is more a personal experience or are there some general qualities that you can give to certain colors that you say, if you use these and these colors, you will be calm. If you use these and these colors, you will not experience anxiety. Is there uh -huh. something in color psychology, Karen, what, what, what works towards a certain group of colors? Yeah, I think that that's a great question and that could take me, you know, all day to answer. But I think the simplest way to answer this is that colors that are very, very low in saturation are typically more soothing because the color, uh, yeah, the color saturation is very, very low. As you as you move up and you have so what's a low saturation color? A beige would be, you know, that's low saturation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's why a lot of people do go for beige because it is very low. A lot of people go for very soft gray because it's low, or light, very soft blues or soft pinks. You know, all of these colors are very very low saturation. If you then go up into the high saturation. This is far more stimulating. So this is far, it takes a lot more emotion and a mu lot, much more energy. So if you think of a soft pink and then you think of its opposite, which is the stimulating red, mm -hmm. even in your mind, you can already feel the energy difference. And that energy is also an emotional energy. And, it, and we, we will feel different in a soft, in a room that has soft pink. And we will feel completely different in a room that is that is that is a you know a fire engine red, and that's because of the way that we take the colour in through our eyes, the way it goes through to the hypothalamus, the way that it then has this connection to our emotion, and the way that we will then respond. Is that red, red and pink? Sorry, so red and pink is physically soothing or physically stimulating. So. There is a lot more to say, but like I said, mm -hmm. I could go on forever about yeah. that. This, but but if the if just to say that the low chrome chromatic is is typically soothing, and the stronger is typically very stimulating. Because that's what I learned from our designers that you have color, you have saturation, and you have hue, and these mm -hmm. three elements actually make what it is that you see. Now I think um, uh, Carola. There is this other system, the NCS color system, that makes use of these color pyramids that has all that that actually have all these aspects of uh, color, saturation, and hue. Is that also present in the Pantheon system? Yeah, the thing is of NCS. This is also a well-known system, especially in the interior part. Yes. We in Pantheon have just a little bit different way of, of organizing our colors, but our numbering system, especially in the fashion home interior system, is exactly also done by lightness, by saturation, by hue. So you can see by the numbering already which color family is behind that, if it's a light or dark color. So we do more or less the same like NCS is doing. We just organize, let's say, our color books a little bit different. So therefore, uh, yeah, but it's it's all coming back to the Mansell thing, which are these famous color trees, which are, by the way, also owned by Pantone. So Mansell is part of Pantone. Mm -hmm. So at the end, uh, it all goes back to the same uh, roots where we set up our color systems. Yeah. There's a question for you, Karen. Do you um, rather you rather create a leaf green or a red interior? Do I, would I prefer? Prefer, yes, if you are. For my, for myself? Yes, it, it, it doesn't say where, oh. it, where, it, where it needs to be. <laughs> oh, if it's to do with a green or red, yes. So for me personally, and this is, this is because of my own personality, I can't be around a lot of red. Mm -hmm. um, because it just, um, it's like it heats me up and it's, it's like, um, you know, driving in turbo it's it's yes. too it's too and because i already have quite a a tigger kind of a, a lively personality if i was around a, if i was in a red room in fact i two years ago at clerkenmore design week there was an artist who did a um uh um a immersive uh, experience and it was in a you know underground and she kept the colors changed and when she did the whole thing in red I actually got really dizzy and I thought I had, I had to go leave and sit down because I thought I was going to pass out. Mm -hmm. I was, I was gobsmacked by my, my reaction, but everyone was like going, Oh, this is amazing. And I just went, no, I've, I've got to leave. Mm -hmm. So for me, I mean, I love being in nature as in 
yes, because now I'm in Australia, I'm down the, by the beach when it's not pouring with rain. But I love when I'm back in the UK, I love being in the forest and I love being around around green. So yes, if, if, if this is your green. answer to your question, mm -hmm. absolutely, because green and, and a nice, a nice, soft, warm green, I can't be around an emerald green, like I can't be around a cold green, it needs to be a warm, a really warm green. And then I feel very, very reassured. And there's this lovely sense of um, feeling um, restored as well. There's another question actually linked to this, which, which, which is about the question, what type of colors would you use for homes for the elderly? Now, this is also something that we at Forbo are faced with. If we are looking at healthcare interiors, education facilities or kindergartens, if we are looking at airports, um, there always is the question whether, whether there is a color scheme that is more suitable here or there. First for Carola, have you ever thought within Pantone to create these color spheres where you can give an advice to your customers. If you are looking for an elderly home, this is the section that you should choose. Have you done yeah. that as a company? Absolutely. We have a big, uh, we call it Pantone Color Institute, which is a, bis a business unit which was growing the last two, three years like crazy. And what we do especially is doing color consultancies. And that can be starting with a question you have asked up to somebody who said like a Lufthansa, for example, who came to us two years ago and said, we have a blue, which we know it's, it's really 30 years old. Can you help us to refresh the blue to mm -hmm. really symbolize our wish? And so we do this very, very often for brands, big ones and smaller ones to help them to refresh it. For example, the Pink Panther, which we all know, the Pink Panther, the character mm -hmm. from television, this was coming up in the 60s with a specific pink. But the pink in the 60s is not the pink which we like to have anymore today for our kids. So we help them to just fine tune a little bit the pink to make it more accessible for kids today. So we do this very, very mm. often. So uh, yeah, this is part of the Panton Color Institute project we are doing and very exciting because you can do it for, for every industry. It's every time a new project for us and every time very, very exciting. Yeah. Karen. On your side, do you look at companies like Pantone to, to actually um, look at those color spaces that they create and you say, well, this is quite nice, but for me, elderly homes should be so and so and so. Or are they pretty knowledgeable at Pantone? <laughs> Don't say something wrong now. <laughs> well, of course, of course. I mean, you know, like Pantone is, how long has Pantone been around? You can't, you can't. Yeah, you can't be around that long and not know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. But the reason why I put my step two in this presentation is because this is exactly where I start from. And I knew I knew this we'd get a question like this because people always say, what's the one color scheme or what can I do in this space? But it's not about, and I never start with color, right? Okay. I, mm -hmm. Because once you start with color, you're down this emotional color rabbit warren. That's why I always start with, behaviors I, st I actually start with what is the end result you're looking for so yes. what are the positive behaviors you're looking for because that's once your I know triggers what and your motivators huh yeah because when yeah. i know what that is when i know what they the outcome is i can i work backwards and i can work out what the colors are because mm -hmm. because once i have the outcome and i've got the colors and the design style once that's all then put together we can then measure it because we know exactly what it is that they're wanting at the end and we can measure whether they've got that. So that's why I always, I always say, you know, it's very much like the movie fight, if anyone's in the movie Fight Club. The first thing about colour is I don't talk about colour. I always talk about behaviours because as soon as you show anyone a swatch of colours, oh, I like that one, oh, I don't like that one, and then you get into this endless debate, you, you know that, yes, in this endless debate, <laughs> and you can't get people out of it. So I actually don't even broach that subject even when I'm first having my consultation. But, you know, in a care home, it's not just a care home. Every single room, every single space has a different purpose, a different function, and mm -hmm. those different spaces those different functions there'll be different behaviors and there'll be different ways that they want people to to the experience so this is you know experiential design is what experience do they want them to have in that particular space and so let's design 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 it sorry 
sorry, obviously it's getting late for me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so because as they're moving through the different rooms and different spaces of a care home, they will want people to behave differently. They don't, it's not, it's not the same the whole way. And what you're wanting, they're not there ever to get well again. It's not about well-being. It is about taking care of them um, and making sure that they can have the best possible experience that they can in that, in that space. So it, you do, you, and you do the exactly the same in a school because all the different classes, all the different kinds of lessons, the different, the purpose of the rooms, all different. So it's again, it's what kind of behaviours, what how someone is in a maths room and what they need to be able to function to do maths is different if they're in drama, you know, they're having drama lessons or they're in a sports hall. Even just saying those, you can straight away, you can you know that people behave differently and there's different colours and combinations of colours that will um, help to influence that. Having said that, there's one uh, final question more or less, or maybe we can do one more. Um, it's more, you, you are colour experts, but there's also colour from the outside, which is natural light. Do you take natural light into account when you are at giving advice on colour schemes, or do you take at Panto natural light into account when, when you look at the real life effect of a colour? Karen first, natural oh, yes. light and colour? Um, Absolutely, because colour is light. I mean, if we didn't have light, we wouldn't see colour. So these uh -huh. two things are absolutely, you know, like this. Yeah. Um, but it's not just natural light, it is light. So, you know, look at the light source. Mm -hmm. I've got three light sources on now. Um, so colour will will absolutely change with, with the lighting. And I always tell all my clients, I tell my students, you might pick a fantastic colour scheme but you've got to take it into the in situ. You've got to have it in the place with the right kind of lighting, like the light, not the lighting that is there at that time, but the lighting that is going to be used. And you need to see how the colours render under that light in that situation, because it could be north facing, south facing, mm -hmm. different different hemispheres. You know, there's there's um, and also different times of the day. So you've got the colour. And I get so many, you know, clients from the home that will say to me, oh, I like the colour in the morning, but I don't like it in the afternoon. And you're trying to explain to them it is actually the same colour. It's the light that's shifting. So it is a, it is, I don't know, I'm sure people might be having a bit of a chuckle because they've just gone, mm -hmm. that happens to them all the time. Yeah. But it is an education process for the, for your clients. Is that part but yeah, of your, light is, is so that important part of your consultancy too, uh, Carola, the, this, this effect of natural light on color. Yeah, absolutely. And I think Karen explained already very well. I can only add some more technical details because exactly what Karen said is we try to educate the professional to really say what you said, Karen, where do you want to sell your products? Is it in a store where you, for example, have fluorescent light condition, which is a very cold light, which is eating all the red parts of the color. You, so you should really approve a color then in a fluorescent light condition and we have light boxes so this is a very common tool to have a light box where you check which light source are important if your interior you maybe have these a lights these warm light things which which are much warmer give the color much more reddish part because still we have a lot of professional clients who go still to the window but like karen said in the morning it's a totally different color like in lunchtime like in the evening and even a humidity and all the other things which mm -hmm. comes across plays a major role and it's really I'm I'm starting my career in, in, in the fashion industry in the end of the 80s and I have been working with going to the window to check colors and to be honest I still have a lot of clients and as I said I'm taking care of the key accounts which still go to the window and I said hey guys you don't sell on the street market you sell in stores watch out for fluorescent light mm -hmm. condition so it's really a major thing and like Karen said without light so make switch off your light tonight in, this, in the sleeping room and then try to look around and find, uh, find any <laughs> color. Everything is gray. And without light, we don't see colors. Yep. Colors are only a reflection of the light. And this we should keep in mind. And okay. every professional mm. should take that as a first learning for if yep. they start to look at color. Okay, good. Well, it's one hour gone, so we need to stop, unfortunately. Um, I started out with Michael Portillo and his colorful coats and trousers and blouses and stuff like that. That's not for everyone, but at least it is a very personal and emotional choice. 
And if you watch the program, it makes the program fun and happy. And there was one comment from a, a listener from, from Norway who said, it is a pity that project developers actually, when they deliver a project, when they deliver a dwelling, everything is white, everything is neutral. Mm -hmm. And the argument always is, don't fill it in for the customer. Yet when you fill it in for the customer, those apartments are quite often more readily and easily sold than the plain white ones. Yeah. Because not everyone has the same type of fantasy. I would like to thank both of you uh, for uh, joining and for your time, your preparation. Uh, especially, of course, Kai and you, because of the time of day, you can <laughs> go to bed now or you can have a glass of wine. I, I, but, oh no, I'm going to bed, I'm going to straight back to bed. <laughs> <laughs> then you have a glass of wine. And with us, it's, a, it's, it's about five o'clock, so we can also have a glass of wine and enjoy yeah, sure. and look around. <laughs> to uh, not leave you with a blank screen at the end of this presentation and to give you some color and some inspiration, we'd like to share a movie with, with you which is our new Marmolian movie. It's about floor covering, but it shows you that floor covering is about nature. It shows you that no floor covering is about emotion and is about color. So I would like to thank all of you who have joined. Like I said, over 1,000 people. You were a great group. Thanks for your questions. Thanks for listening. And see you next time around June with our next topic on the Forwell webinar tour. Bye-bye. Since more than 100 years, we have been making floor coverings for our everyday life, exploring innovation, and looking to create better environments. We have been inspired by what is all around us. And we are convinced that our best engineer is nature. With its help, we have created Marmolian. A unique linoleum floor covering made of natural raw materials. By learning to work with our planet, and its organic cycles. Forbo Flooring Systems is able to make one of the most sustainable products. Made from natural raw material such as linseed oil, wood flour, limestone, resin, and jute. With the women and men supplying our raw materials, we are committed to work with respect. Using resources from nature while letting it regenerate. With Marmolium, we are proud to make durable flooring truly CO2 neutral. From the origins to the final product without buying carbon credits. By working with our ecosystems, we create better environments. Today we have a choice. Produce better, to live better. Let nature come inside. Good for people, for buildings, and for our planet. Mammolium, provided by nature, made truly CO2 neutral. Four ball flooring systems. <laughs>